Good morning, this is the Macro Church of Christ Sunday Acts study. We're starting in Acts 26 and verse 24. And we're looking at Paul during his imprisonment. You remember as we were studying that Paul was here at Corinth or uh, Caesarea right here. And he had just been in Jerusalem, remember he was arrested. And he's been in Caesarea for a few years, maybe like three years he's been here or he's going on his third year, and he has been before various authorities giving his defense, and none of them have been able to find anything that's worthy of death or imprisonment, but they are keeping Paul in prison in order to do the Jews a favor. But the Jews are still uh, bent set uh, on executing him and having him killed, and so <clears throat> they continue to uh, try to persuade them to get rid of Paul, but finally Paul uh, made an appeal to Caesar, and so we're going to be we're going to find that he's going to be sent on a trip to to Caesar, to Rome, and this is the route he's going to take. And this is why this is sometimes called Paul's fourth missionary journey. Now, as we take a look at Acts chapter twenty six, remember that uh, Paul was giving his defense before King Agrippa here in verses one uh, down to verse eleven, and Paul tells then about his conversion and about the fact that his conversion. Uh, resulted as him because he saw the light. It wasn't something that was done in secret or in a corner. It was something that was wide open, something that everybody knew, uh, and it wasn't something that uh, he just received by himself when there was no witnesses or evidence. Uh, many of the uh, supposed religions today that have started have started uh, by them having things done to them in secret, but there's nothing in the gospel that indicates anything that Jesus did was secret or hidden from individuals as he began to reveal it, but that it was made known to everybody. And so Paul was giving his defense, and he pointed out, first of all, the kind of life that he lived before he was a Christian or before he was a follower of Jesus, and then his actions afterwards. And so he pointed out that he began to proclaim that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he's Lord and King, and that message that he Preach, uh, he was going to preach to the Gentiles. And right there in verse 24, it says, we'll start reading Acts 26, 24. While Paul was saying this in his defense, Festus said in a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you mad. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I utter words of sober truth. For the king knows about these matters, and I, uh, and I speak to him also uh, with confidence, since I am persuaded that none of these things escaped his notice, for this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do. Agrippa replied to Paul, in a short time you will persuade me to become a Christian? And Paul said, I would wish to God that uh, whether in a short or long time, not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. Uh, the king stood up uh, and the governor and uh, Bernice <coughs> and those who were sitting with them. And when they had gone aside, they began talking to one another, saying, This man is not doing anything worthy of death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, This man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. And so what we have here in verse 24 is we have as Paul is preaching, we have the, the reaction of those people who were listening to him, especially, fella, uh, especially uh, uh, Festus and Agrippa, and remember Bernice, and, and uh, Paul was giving his defense to them, and it says, while Paul was saying this in his defense, Festus said in a loud voice, Paul, you're out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you mad. You know, it's interesting that um, uh, King Agrippa, or I'm sorry, Festus says that, because certainly some people uh, are so educated, it's, it's to their detriment because they have so much uh, learning uh, and they rely on their learning more than they rely on their faith in God. And, and therefore, it causes them to teach things and do things that are contrary to the will of God. And so it does make them out of their mind, you might say. Now, there, there's nothing wrong with learning or education, uh, but we do have to remember what the book of Ecclesiastes said. Uh, over here uh, in, uh, in 
uh, Ecclesiastes in the very last, ver the very last few verses uh, says this. Uh, it's, uh, he says uh, in the verse that I want is, uh, oh yeah, here in verse seven, or sorry, verse 11. It says, the words of the wise men are like goads and masters of these collections are like well-driven nails. They are given by one shepherd. But beyond this, my son, be warned. The writing of many books is endless, and excessive devotion to books is wearying to the body. And I take that to mean that, that you can go and you can read everything you want, and there's always books to read. There's always something to learn. There's always education out there. Uh, but it turns out to be wearying to the body. Uh, there's only really so much that a person can really take and they need to devote themselves really to what God says. So it's interesting that, that Festus said to Paul that in allow, uh, said, you are driving, um, you are out of your mind, your great learning is driving you mad. Now, one of the other things that this points out is that they recognize that Paul was an educated individual. He wasn't some, uh, you know, uh, yokel from the backwoods or somebody like the, like the apostles who were Galileans and grew up in a place where uh, education wasn't the most important thing, and it wasn't known for education, uh, but Paul was brought up at the feet of Gamaliel in Jerusalem uh, in the Jewish community, and he, he had a very high um, educational uh, learning, and uh, therefore they, they understood that. So just because somebody has a, a, a good education doesn't mean that they're, they can't be Christians. Uh, the problem we need to understand is that you have to filter everything you learn, wherever you learn it, whether in school or whether just through regular conversations with people or through books. You have to make sure that everything that you're learning is filtered through the Word of God, and not the other way around. You don't filter what you you don't filter the Word of God through what you learn. You filter what you learn through the Word of God, and that's where that's where some people have have made a mistake. They, they as they become more educated and as they become more, you might say, scientific, uh, and they learn all this stuff that science tells them, rather than filtering the science they learn through the Word of God, instead, they accept what the, what the scientists say, and they filter what, they, what the, the Bible says through their learning. And so, therefore, they come up with things like, well, Genesis chapter 1 can't be true, because evolution shows us that, uh, that uh, we started off from, from these you know, primordial ooze is where we started from, but yet that doesn't answer the real question. And so that's an example of using the science as a filter for the Bible instead of the Bible as a, as a filter for science. And so there's nothing wrong with, with learning, but you have to filter everything that you learn through the word of God. Because remember, Christians live by faith. We live by hearing the word of God. That's what, where we put our trust in. And anything that's contrary to the word of God is suspect. Uh, and that doesn't mean that we throw out science. Uh, we, don't throw out, we don't throw out science, but science is used to uh, prove the things of God, not to destroy the things of God. And there's nothing wrong with science as long as it's good science. Bad science is, is bad. And by the way, that also includes bad Bible. Bad Bible interpretations are bad. And so when you have good Bible interpretation and you have good science, they're going to mesh together. But anyway, just wanted to point out that to be a Christian doesn't mean you have to be dumb. Uh, they understood that Paul was, was very educated because of his learning. Verse 25, Paul says, I, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I utter words of sober truth. And so uh, Paul points out that he's not crazy because what he's uttering is words of sober truth. In other words, he's uttering words that are truthful, that are relevant, that are authentic and, and genuine. Uh, the word truth doesn't just simply mean get the data right, uh, but it means that, that the, the message is exactly accurate and is uh, from God and therefore is the truth and, and is what we should rely on and is genuine or genuine. And, and therefore, it's to be accepted. It's historical. It's real. It's not, it's not fake. It's not made up. It's sober truth. It's truth that caused Paul to become sober. Because if you remember, he was drunk 
he was drunk with rage and he was drunk with with his own uh, sense of self-worth and his own um, suppositions until God finally came and, and showed him the light, at which time he yielded to the sober truth. It sobered him up, you might say, kind of like a drunk who's, who's drunk, uh, who's drunk and, and then all of a sudden he gets sobered up. Um, or a, um, a ruler who's, who's drunk on power, and then God comes along and sobers him up like Nebuchadnezzar did when he was bragging about the great city and the great empire that he had made, and God made him eat grass for seven periods of time until he learned that, that God's the one who sets people up to be kings and rulers. And so uh, Paul understood that Jesus is the Messiah, that he's the Christ, and he learned this, and it's sober truth. It's truth that will sober you up. Verse 26 says, for the king knows about these matters, and I, I, I speak to him with all, I speak to him also with confidence, since I am persuaded that none of these things escaped his notice, for this was not done in a corner. Now, uh, Paul, as he utters sober truth, it helps us understand that they are that this sober truth is historical. It is historical truth. It's not it's not um, mythical or mystical. It is sober truth. It, it's reality. It happened in real life. That's where that's where for us sober truth happens. Truth for us who are humans and live in this world has to happen in our world. If it happens outside, we don't know if it's truth because we don't live outside of our world. So it has to be in our world. <coughs> And so verse 26, Paul says, uh, for the king knows th uh, about these matters. So the king was aware of these uh, situations that Paul is, is teaching about. He, he was aware, uh, um, or at least he probably heard the story, not only about Jesus being, you know, a, a rabbi and, and healing people and doing miracles and teaching and then being crucified and dying and, and the... the um, uh, idea that that he was raised from the dead while other people are saying no that his disciples stole his body uh, I'm sure the king heard all of those things and knew all of those things uh, that would be something that the king of this area would need to know because that's important because it it uh, is uh, dealing with a king and how those people that follow that king follow him and so you know that that any king uh, would want to know about these matters. So, so Paul was persuaded that Festus knew these things. And he says, and I speak to, to him also with confidence. Uh, and in other words, Paul is saying that, that he's a witness to these things. He's confident. He's not saying these things that Jesus is alive and sitting at the right hand of God and his king. He's not saying these things because somebody told him. He's saying these things because he has confidence. He knows exactly because the Lord appeared to him. And it says, since I am persuaded that none of these things escaped his notice. In other words, Paul's saying, you know these things. And why does he know these things? He says, for this has not been done in a corner. And in other words, what Paul's saying is this, this message of the gospel and this message of the risen Christ was not done in secret. In, uh, Jesus didn't die. And then all of a sudden just kind of disappear and drift away. And now people are saying that he's in heaven. And, and there's no way of knowing. Uh, Jesus gave us historical proof. Uh, he, he gave us sober truth. Uh, they knew that he had been killed. They knew that they couldn't find his body. In 1 Corinthians 15, it says that, that Jesus had been seen by 500 brethren at one time, besides those intimate friends that knew him, his apostles and his brother and his family. Uh, and so, uh, this Jesus being raised from the dead wasn't something that was done in secret. It wasn't something that nobody knew or nobody, or, or nobody saw. Uh, it's interesting that the religions of our world that have started have started and have been told uh, that they started because a person saw some vision or received some tablets in secret and that nobody knows about the tablets and nobody knows about the secrets and nobody knows about um, uh, how these things uh, were received. Uh, Joseph Smith supposedly received a secret message from the angel Moroni that told him about some tablets. And some people say, well, there were witnesses. Yeah, but the problem is, is that five, uh, uh, if I remember right, five of those witnesses 
recanted uh, what they said before they died. Uh, and, and so therefore, uh, uh, how can you uh, uh, verify that the other ones are speaking the truth when the majority of them recanted uh, their story uh, ab about seeing those golden plates? And not only that, but uh, Buddha himself supposedly received a secret message uh, from the heavenly hosts, however, however you want to say that. Uh, and uh, he too uh, saw this secret uh, uh, vision. And, and so there's, there's many, many groups that have started because somebody see, has seen a secret vision or has seen something that nobody else saw and, and they go off and they start some, some religion. But the things of God are done open and, and they're historical and they're objective. By that, I mean, Paul didn't just have a vision in his mind. As, as he was going through his defense, he said that there were other Jews that were with him that saw the light and they heard the, the, the conversation. They didn't understand the conversation, but they heard the conversation that was going on. And so that there were witnesses to the things that were happening. And then Paul was blind and everybody for the next three days would wonder why Paul was blind. And then all of a sudden when Ananias came, Paul can then see and, and they can certainly see all that. So, so the things of Jesus and the things of God are never done in secret. Uh, they're not done in back rooms. Uh, and then all of a sudden they're, they're brought out so that, so that uh, people will follow uh, the persuasive words of the individual who claims to have seen those, those uh, visions or those um, dreams or whatever they were. And so Paul points out that these things weren't done in a corner. They're historical. They're real. They're, they're authentic. They're genuine, the, the events that Paul is talking about. And so, you know, that, that therefore requires individuals who say they believe in, in history. It requires them to have to make a decision about this, this man named Jesus. He was a real historical figure. Now, what's also interesting is, is believe it or not, some people might doubt Jesus. And some people might doubt the fact that Jesus even ever lived, although there is sufficient proof. But nobody, nobody can doubt that Paul lived. Nobody. Because we have all his writings. We have all these writings written by Paul. And Paul, nobody would say, was a fictitious character. And, and so Paul is really an individual who gives us uh, undeniable, verifiable proof to the story of Jesus even uh, though there, there is sufficient evidence without Paul, uh, Paul adds such weight to the fact that Jesus is the Messiah and is the Christ and was dead and was raised uh, from the grave and ascended to heaven and is sitting at God's right hand. Paul is one of the greatest witnesses for that. And so individuals who talk about history are going to have to deal with that, that they have to deal with Paul. They have to deal with the history of Jesus. They can't just ignore it and act like it didn't happen. Uh, if they're truthful to history, that is. Now, if, if they want to lie about history, they certainly can. But that doesn't change all the letters Paul wrote. Uh, and it doesn't change the letters of the other apostles and the other writers that wrote about Jesus and the history that we have about them. We have more information about Jesus uh, in the writings of the New Testament than all of the galactic wars of the Roman Empire that are taught in universities uh, and that you can take courses on. Uh, there's more uh, verifiable um, texts and writings and evidence to Jesus and to, to the apostles than there is to uh, the Quran, than there is to the Book of Mormon, uh, than there is to the writings of Buddha. And so these things didn't happen in the corner. In verse 27, and King uh, Paul, remember Paul is, is, is talking to King Agrippa. He says, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do. Now, here's what I want you to understand about this idea of do you believe the prophets. Paul has been trying to get the Jewish community to understand that he didn't leave the, the Jewish religion, but that he, in fact, is following it to its proper fulfillment, that is, Jesus. And, and Paul points out to King Agrippa that King Agrippa knows the prophets. King Agrippa believes the prophets. And so if, if King Agrippa believes the prophets, then he, and he knows the history that's going on, then it should be a perfect hand uh, uh, glove uh, 
on hand or uh, hand in glove, they, they fit perfectly. The prophecies of the Old Testament about the suffering servant of Isaiah 53, there's no way anybody with, a, with any, any semblance of reason can't see that that's a story about Jesus on the cross and his uh, substitutionary death for our crimes. There's nobody who would deny that, who has any sense of, of reason. Now, they can make up stories about it, but it fits perfectly with what happened to Jesus. Or Psalms 22, uh, the, uh, the psalm that talks about the crucifixion of Jesus. It, it, nobody can, can take that and deny that uh, Jesus uh, isn't at least referred to in it and that he's the ultimate fulfillment of it. Uh, and, and so when you look at the prophets, and if you believe the prophets, then you got to come to the conclusion that this Jesus really is who the prophets were waiting on. And therefore, Paul is not against the Jewish religion, but he's bringing it to, it, to its complete and, uh, and to, its full, to its completion and its fulfillment. Now, when I say fulfillment, uh, I'm talking about its fulfillment from the standpoint of Jesus coming and, and being the Messiah like God promised, setting up his kingdom like God promised. And we're now living in the fulfillment of it, uh, of this kingdom. And there are certain things that Jesus will do in this kingdom, but the kingdom itself is already here. And so Paul uh, reminds King Agrippa about the prophets. And then Paul says, I know that you do. In other words, Paul, Paul was uh, aware of some of King Agrippa's circumstances and, and some of his education and some of who King Agrippa was. And so Paul knew that he, he knew the Old Testament and he knew the prophets. Uh, and so uh, Paul tells him, I know that you believe the prophets. Now, what's the reaction of Agrippa? Agrippa replied to Paul, in a short time, you'll persuade me to become a Christian. Now, a couple of things to notice. Uh, one of those is that King Agrippa identified this, these group of people as Christian. This word Christian is only used three times in Scripture. And I'd suggest to you that every time it's used, it's used for, for the purpose of maligning Christians. Now, that doesn't mean that the name can't be used to honor Jesus, but I'd suggest to you that uh, the circumstances in which we find the three incidents that it's used have to do with uh, how other people uh, saw them and how other people viewed them and, and considered them. Now, take a look at Acts 11 and verse 25. It says, uh, talking about Barnabas, it says, uh, he left for Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch, and for an entire year, they met with the church and taught considerable numbers. And the disciples were called Christians in Antioch. So it's interesting that here, as they're teaching people, the, Christ, the disciples are called Christians in Antioch. Now, it doesn't say who call them Christians. And it's interesting that as you continue reading the book of Acts, Paul doesn't use the word Christians when he talks about the disciples. He uses the word disciples, or he uses the word saints, or he uses the word brothers. It would seem that if the word Christian was a word that was designated by God for his people to wear, that the Apostle Paul uh, and Luke, who are writing this book, would certainly have pinned that and would have shown that, that the apostles and the, the, the faithful brethren now call each other Christians, but you don't see that. And that suggests that you don't see that because this name wasn't necessarily a name given to them by uh, the Lord, although there's nothing wrong with the name, but was given to them by the community of people to kind of uh, discourage them or disperse them. In other words, they were, they were looking down at them uh, uh, kind of like um, um, somebody says, you're, you're, you're one of those devilish people. Uh, and, and the word Christian means one who is like Christ. And so, uh, therefore, they would, uh, the, the um, world uh, would see the Christians as those people who are acting like Christ. Uh, I, I don't think that the apostles or the disciples ever uh, called each other that, because that, that kind of would imply that, that we are 
oh, how's a good way of saying this? Uh, it, 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 almost, it almost would be braggadocious to say, yeah, I'm a Christian. But today it's so common that we don't even think of the, the implications of the word. But I'd just like to suggest to you that, that the word Christian and the three places in, in, which, is, in which it was used is a, a word that, that indicates a uh, word that was used against the Christians for the purpose of persecuting them or maligning them. And I'd suggest to you that's why in 1 Peter chapter 4, when Peter is talking about the persecution of Christians, uh, he mentions this. Uh, follow along with me, if you would, beginning at verse 12, 1, 1 Peter 4, 12. He says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeals among you which come upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the suffering of Christ, keep on rejoicing so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exaltation. So the, the Christians are being persecuted. They're undergoing fiery tribulations, and they're sharing in the suffering of Christ. Now look at verse 14. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer or thief or evildoer or troublesome meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in this name. So uh, Peter points out in a, in a period of persecution that that's when they're glorifying the name Christian. That that's when people are saying, oh, he, oh we're putting to death these Christ-like people. These people who believe excuse me, these people who belong to, to Christ. And so where they're, they're using the word, you might say, in, in a way to malign the Christians. Uh, and so the, those two places seem, seem to indicate that. But it's interesting that it's only used three times. So when, so, when we, so when we go back to Acts chapter 26, and down here where we're looking at King Agrippa, and, and Agrippa says, in verse 28, he says, in a short time, will you persuade me to become a Christian? Uh, I don't really think that what Agrippa is saying is, yeah, I'm going to become one, one of these believers, but he's using it in a disparaging way. And he's pointing out that you really want me to become one of these Christian people? You, you, you're trying to persuade me to be one of, these, one of these guys that follows this risen Messiah? Um, that's what you're trying to do, Paul? Now, verse 29, and Paul said, I would wish to God that whether in short or long time, not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these, uh, except for these chains. Now, I want you to notice that Paul points out that he is trying to get people to be followers of Jesus. That's Paul's mission. Paul's mission wasn't to come and reform the world or to reform politics uh, or to uh, uh, reform the things that are going on. Um, don't misunderstand me. Those reforms may come, but they don't come by actually trying to reform those things. They come by reforming people and by getting individuals to follow Jesus and the principles that are taught by him. And so he says, I would wish to God that whether in a short or long time, not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. And, and so Paul wants everybody to become just like him. In other words, that Paul wants that individuals to become followers of Jesus. Paul isn't saying, I want everybody to be an apostle. Paul isn't saying, I want everybody to have to go out and preach the gospel and, and you know, leave their homes like I have done and go to all parts of the world and preach, although there'd be nothing wrong with that. That's not what Paul is saying. What Paul is saying is, I want everybody to become a Christian. I want everybody to be saved. I want everybody to have a relationship with God. That's the most important thing. And we as parents and grandparents need to understand that. The most important thing is, our, uh, is that our children have a relationship with God. It doesn't matter what school they go to. It doesn't matter what baseball team they belong to. It doesn't matter how good they can play sports. What matters is, do they have a right relationship with God and are they honoring that in their life? Or is there something more important in their life? And if there's something more important in their life, then we have failed to teach them uh, that God is supposed to come first. And that's what Paul wants. 
And so not only does that include our family and our children, it includes our spouse, our friends, those people that we come in contact with, but all those individuals need to come to know Jesus. So in verse 30, it says, uh, the king stood up uh, and the governor and Bernice uh, and those who were sitting with them. And when they had gone aside, they began talking to one another saying, this man is not doing anything worthy of death or imprisonment. Uh, and Agrippa said to uh, Festus, this man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Now, uh, again, what I want you to understand is that here Paul, I believe for the fourth time, has been examined, and they have found nothing in his activity or in his actions that are worthy of him being imprisoned or being uh, executed. Uh, and so it's interesting that uh, all of them, all of the people that examined Paul, none of them found him to be guilty of any crime that's worthy of him being number one, locked up, and number two, being, being put to death. And, and so why was it that they kept Paul in prison all this time? Because they were appealing to the Jews. They were trying to keep trouble from erupting. And if they let Paul go, they knew trouble would erupt. And so they, uh, even though it wasn't right and it wasn't just, uh, they uh, kept Paul uh, in prison, but yet it wasn't uh, like solitary confinement. Uh, Paul could have visitors and, Paul, and people could come see Paul, and, and no doubt Paul had a little bit of freedom. Uh, and so, so therefore, you might say he was being kept under uh, maybe just, just um, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Oh, for the sake of protection, protecting him. And, and keeping the Jews from killing him if they let him go. So certainly there, there were those motives, but the main one was the Romans were just simply trying to appeal to the Jews. But their sense of justice was such that they were not gonna kill Paul just because the Jewish community wanted him dead. And so again, that shows you the difference between the Jewish sense of justice and the Roman sense of justice uh, that we see throughout the book of Acts. Uh, and that didn't change uh, until, um, later on when the Roman Empire, rather than looking at the Christians as a sect of the Jewish community, began to see them as a, a separate religion, and therefore they began to persecute them. Now, uh, what that means is that everything that Paul says is true. They, they, they didn't find anything that Paul said that was wrong. And it, so it says, uh, this man is, do, is not doing anything worthy of death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, this man might have been set free if he hadn't appealed to Caesar. Well, they weren't going to let set him free because of the, of the Jews. But the point is that they examined him again, and they didn't find anything wrong with him. So what's going to happen? Well, what's going to happen is that Paul is now going to continue on his missionary journey. And so as we take a look at Paul's journey, let me remind you of this um, little map here, and, and notice that uh, he's in Caesarea, and from Caesarea, he's going to go to Sidon. He's going to uh, go around over here, Cyprus. He's going to come to uh, Myra, and then uh, over here to uh, Snidus. And, and when, when he's there, uh, he's going to come over here to Crete, and he's going to roam around in here and have a, this, have a, uh, a storm. Uh, and then finally, he's going to end up over here in Malta, where we're going to find him ending up. So right now we're going to see in chapter 27 that he's going to go on his ship and he's going to go on his journey. He's coming up here to Rome, up here. And when he gets to Rome, then he's going to be able to give his defense before Caesar if Caesar sees his um, case worthy enough for his attention. Caesar would be like our Supreme Court, you might say. And that is that they, they have to consider the, the case so relevant that it would it would be worthy of their time and their energy. And so, but Paul uh, nonetheless uh, was going there in order to see if he could do that. So that's what we have in chapter 27. We basically have this story uh, of him uh, sailing. So it says, when it was decided that we would sail to Italy, they proceeded to deliver Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustus cohort named Julius and embarking in an Adramithian ship, 
uh, which was about to sail to the regions along the coast of Asia, we put out to sea, accompanied by Aristarchus of Macedonia, uh, a Macedonian of Thessalonica. And the next day we, we put in at Sidon. And Julius treated Paul with consideration and allowed him to go to his friends and receive care. From there, we put out to sea and sailed under the shelter of Cyprus because the wind was contrary. When we had sailed through the sea along the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we landed at uh, Myra in Lycia. Uh, there the centurion found an uh, Adrian ship, an Alexandrian ship, uh, sailing uh, for Italy, and he put us aboard it. When we had sailed slowly for, the, for a good many days, and with difficulty had arrived off Snidus, since the wind did not permit us to go further, we sailed under the shelter of Crete of uh, Salmon. And with difficulty sailing past it, we came to a place called Fair Haven, near which was the city of Lycia. When considerable time had passed and the voyage was now danger, dangerous, since even the fast was already over, Paul began to admonish them and said to them, men, I perceive that the voyage will certainly be with damage and great loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. But the centurion was not uh, persuaded by, I'm sorry, but the centurion was more persuaded by the pilot and the captain of the ship than what Paul was being said by Paul, than what was being said by Paul. Because the harbor was not suitable for win wintering, the majority reached a decision to put out to sea from there. If somehow they might, they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete, facing southward and northward and spend the winter there. And so here, here we have the, the beginning of this adventure, the beginning of this, this uh, route that Paul is taking, uh, that he's going to be going on. And I, I want you to notice that verse one says, uh, when it was decided that we would sail to Italy, they proceeded to deliver Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion uh, of the Augustus cohort named Julius. Now, if you remember here in our little chart, the fastest way to get to Rome is by boat. You could get there by land if you went up this way and then crossed up here and then went around this way and went way up here and then came down, but that would take quite a bit of time. The fastest way to get there was through the Mediterranean uh, Sea and, and uh, through the transportation hubs that would be going through there. And so that's what we see. Uh, we see that he leave, he's going to leave Caesarea. He's going to go to Sidon. He's going to uh, end up over here uh, where he's going to board uh, an Alexandrian ship. But uh, let's notice what's, what's said as we continue. Now, so they were sailing to Italy. And it says, and they proceeded to deliver Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion. So Paul wasn't the only one going to Rome. There were other prisoners that were going to Rome, but Paul is getting an all expense paid trip to Rome uh, because the Holy Spirit had told him that he had to go see Rome anyway. And so what better way than, than having the state pay for you? And, and that's what we see of Paul. So that, that's kind of funny as you think about this. Now, the other thing I want you to notice is that, again, we have a centurion. And this centurion is of the Augustus cohort, uh, and uh, his name was Julius. And so Julius is, is a centurion. And remember, I told you that every time you read about centurions in the, in the book of Acts, they were always good, decent people. Uh, they took their responsibility very seriously, and, and they seemed to be honest and upright. And we're going to notice that about this centurion here. Uh, as we uh, continue with our story. But remember that he's a centurion and his name is Julius. It says, and embarking in an, a, a, a Dramidian ship, which was about to sail uh, to the regions along the coast of Asia, uh, we put out to sea accompanied by Aristarchus of Macedonia at Thess uh, Thessalonica. So Aristarchus was this individual that had been accompanying Paul, you remember. And he'd been accompanying Paul 
because he was one of those that was bringing money to the church at, at Jerusalem. And so apparently he had either been with Paul during all this time, or he stayed in Jerusalem, uh, because if you remember in, in Acts uh, in Acts 20, and down here, verse 24, uh, when Paul is, is talking about the people that were accompanying him, remember this is on his way to, to Jerusalem, it says, and he was accompanied by uh, Sopater of Berea, the son of uh, Pyrrhus, and of Aristarchus and Segundus of the Thessalonians, and Gaius and Derby and Timothy and Tychicus and Trophimus of Asia. And so uh, we have this uh, individual, uh, Aristarchus, who is with Paul and, and who had come from uh, Thessalonica along with uh, uh, Secundus. Now, it doesn't say Secundus was writing back with him. It just says Aristarchus was, was uh, writing back on the same ship. Now, I don't know. Uh, and and maybe it's hard to uh, maybe we will never know for sure. But, um, we don't know whether Aristarchus just happened to be in business there at Caesarea and happened to just you know board the same boat that that uh, Paul was ha happened to be boarding uh, on. Um, uh, although it doesn't seem that way, uh, I remember uh, once uh, my wife and I were had gone to Texas to visit my parents. And on the way back, a, a, a preacher friend of mine happened to be on the exact same flight that we were on. And so I sat with him on the way home uh, discussing um, church things. And so I, it, it seems like here, uh, uh, Aristarchus had been accompanying them. And so Aristarchus probably had been with Paul all this time. Now, remember that Paul was there in Jerusalem for... Uh, you know, that's where he was arrested, then ended up in Caesarea for a number of years, uh, a couple of years, and so apparently Aristarchus had, had stayed there for all that, that time, or maybe he went back home and then came back. Uh, we don't know, but uh, whatever the case, Aristarchus, uh, of, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, was, ha was on the same ship because no doubt he was go going to go uh, back home, uh, I believe, uh, as you uh, uh, think about him. Uh, and so uh, it says in verse 3, and the next day we put in at Sidon, and Julius treated Paul with com consideration and allowed him to go to his friends and receive care. And so it, it says that they went to Sidon, and I believe this map shows that here. Here's Sidon right there. So they went up uh, along the coastline of this area here, which, which would be known as Phoenicia, I don't know what it's known as now. It, it would have been Phoenicia back then. And they came to the city of Sidon, which is the capital of that area. And so no, no doubt the, the um, captain of the, of the ship had cargo or was going to pick up more people there. Because you have to think of this boat kind of like a, a bus. And they would stop at various places to, to unload and, and pick up loads and, and transfer goods and and, and exchange people and drop people off and pick people up. Uh, and so what's interesting is though, while Paul was here at Sidon, the centurion allowed Paul some liberty and allowed him to go to his friends. And so apparently uh, Paul was uh, considered trustworthy enough that uh, the centurion would allow Paul some freedom to go and not worry about him returning, <coughs> that, that he would return. And so that tells you something about Paul's reputation, even in prison. Uh, he, he wasn't somebody who was constantly trying to escape. He wasn't somebody who was tr constantly trying to figure out, you know, how to get, how to get out of his situation. It, it, uh, I believe if Paul got out of his situation, it was going to be done above board, according to the law, and civilly, and Paul was not going to break out. And apparently the Lord didn't send an angel to break Paul out of prison like he did Peter. And so Paul was just patiently waiting to see what would happen and what God had planned for him. And, but they came to Sidon, and in Sidon, Julius treated Paul with consideration and allowed him to go to his friends and receive care. So Paul's friends were, were allowed to come minister to him. And he was allowed to go to them uh, so that uh, they would receive, he would receive some care. And it says from there... 
we, we put out to sea and sailed under the shelter of Cyprus because the winds were contrary. So again, if you take a look at the, at the map, uh, they sailed uh, under Cyprus. This is Cyprus right here. And so they sailed between here. In other words, they didn't want to go through here, through the middle of the, of the Mediterranean Sea, because the wind wasn't favorable. And so they wanted to kind of scoot along this coast here where Cyprus would block the, the, the wind a little bit and create a whirlwind, you might say, and, and they would have better winds then for the purpose of being able to sail to where, where they were going. Uh, and so that they went and skirted a long creed here, uh, and then we're gonna continue their journey. And so that, that's, what, that's what that verse means uh, when it says, for, from there we put out to sea and sailed under the shelter of Cyprus because the winds were contrary to us. When we had sailed through the sea, along the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we landed at uh, Myra in uh, Lycia. And so again, if you take a look at this map, uh, you notice that they sailed from Sidon through here, and it says they, they sailed around um, uh, uh, Pamphylia and Lycia, and they came over here and they landed at, at Myra. And so there was another port uh, that was suitable for them to be able to uh, go in and trade or do whatever they needed to, they needed to do was right, was right here. And so they, they again, uh, are on their journey. Uh, and, and then it says uh, in, uh, in verse uh, five, and when we had uh, sailed through the sea along the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we landed at Myra in, in Lycia. Uh, and so they, they landed there. And it says, and there the centurions found an Alexandrian ship sailing for Italy and, we, and put us aboard it. So here you see that they changed ships, uh, just like you would change a, you know, a bus or an, or an airplane when you're traveling from one place to another. Uh, and so they boarded an Alexandrian ship uh, and it was sailing for Italy. And they, and they put, put them on them. So, so they're on this ship now that's from Italy and, and they're sailing. And it says, when we had sailed slowly for a good many days and with difficulty had arrived off uh, Snidus, since the wind did not permit us to go further, we sailed under the shelter of Crete off uh, Salmon. And so if you look at the chart again, you notice that, that he's talking about from here. From here, they were at Myra, and they said sail over here, and they, they got to, to uh, Snidus is where they got. Uh, and it says they did that with difficulty. And what that probably means is that the wind was blowing contrary to the way they were going. And when that happens, it takes a lot longer for the ship to get to where it's going uh, because they can't just have the wind behind them pushing them, uh, they have to tack back and forth, uh, trying to use the wind to drive them uh, forward, trying to use a front wind to drive them f forward. And that takes more time and, and, and more energy and it's longer. And so anyway, they ended up here at Snidus and we're gonna stop here at Snidus as we, as we uh, will continue this. Uh, and so we're gonna, we're gonna stop right here in, in well, actually, at uh, Lycia is where they ended up. And so they end up at, at Lycia. And that's, that's where we're going to start next week in verse 9. Uh, we're glad you're here. Pray the Lord bless you for being here and pray he continues to keep you and bless you and watch over you. Uh, thanks for coming.